Well, first off, I just want to say it's such an honor to be, um, to be here and invited to give a talk. And so thank you for all uh, coming and watching. Um, I uh, am in the Department of Quantitative Psychology, and I'll be presenting on MRI data. Uh, however, I do want to warn you that I'm not a neuroscientist. I work with people who are neuroscientists on their data and the issues that they have to try to develop methods that get around some of the problems that they're encountering. And so uh, I just want to acknowledge, first off, um, people who have really contributed to the work I'm going to present. Um, this would be my dissertation advisor, Dr. Peter Molinar who is at uh, Penn State, and then also um, all these neuroscientists that I work with. Uh, mainly uh, for this particular presentation, I'll be working um, on data that I've uh, explored with Damien Fair, who's at Oregon Health and Science University. But uh, I also work very closely with um, John Ritchie, Susie Scherf, Steve Wilson, Frank Hillary Prasanna, Karuna Nayaka, on uh, all of these problems. So they have definitely um, contributed to my thinking and uh, my exploration of these issues. So just to uh, kind of reframe, and this is a little bit um, redundant from uh, Isabel's talk, or excuse me, from uh, Catherine's talk. <laughs> but uh, traditionally, MRI researchers were focused on finding uh, isolated regions that were task-related. and. Um, uh, that carried the field forward, certainly, and now what people are looking for are uh, connections. And so the idea behind this, which was, um, j just to, to revisit it quickly, even though it was explained much clearer um, in the previous talk, uh, just the, the basic idea behind this is that now we're thinking that a uh, region might be related to emotions such as amygdala, but in the presence of a specific task, it might call on or be influenced by other regions. And that's really what we want to get at, is that the brain doesn't work in isolated chunks, it works as in coordinated activity. And so that's where connectivity mapping came in, is, uh, and these network approaches. Uh, I say connectivity mapping because that's the terminology used in MRI, and so um, that's probably what I'll say throughout the uh, talk. Uh, so what the idea here is to try to get at um, patterns that explain how the brain is functioning. And uh, I'm going to talk about a data set um, towards towards the end of the talk, uh, my case study is a data set that's 80 children, and we had resting state connectivity data. And uh, about 40% of the uh, individuals have ADHD. The others are typically developing controls. Um, but prior to going into that, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of my methods and our approaches of why we are, um, of the concerns that we have, and then our, our ways of accommodating them. So first, um, uh, I think uh, th this was also alluded to in the previous talk, that uh, once you have these connectivity maps, what do you then ask? Uh, what, can you, what can you get from these? And this is something that's still an emerging field. Uh, for instance, with um, Susie Scherf, she's focused also on autism and facial recognition. And uh, she's actually looking for very specific connections and directions of connections and how they change across age development. And so can we identify at a certain age where we see more connectivity between the face facial regions, for instance, the FFA, the OFA, and the STS, and how that differentiate from other visual um, regions? Because in the, in the early years, they're all uh, working together and they, they differentiate as you grow. Um, so that would be an example of having a pattern, and so you're going to qualitatively compare them. Uh, you could always um, explore some other methods for comparing them, uh, but that, that's just uh, the first take at it. Um, another one that people explore is looking at the weights of connections. So how much does a specific connection of interest uh, vary across given populations, or does it relate with performance? Uh, and then the final question is, that I'm seeing is, um, is there evidence for a specific hypothesis? Um, there's the less is more hypothesis that uh, Frank Hillary is very interested in. He works with traumatic brain injured individuals. and. Um, his hypothesis is that when you see a lot of connectivity, so a lot of uh, connections or adjacencies, that that's indicative of an inefficient brain and that as people uh, get better and improve their performance on their tasks, you should, see, you should see more efficiency and you should see fewer connections. And so that's just a way in that adding up the connections can be informative into what the brain processes is. So I think what, what I'm trying to allude here is that once you have the connectivity maps, it's not the end of the story. You then have to make some sort of inference about them. You either compare groups or you, you come up with some sort of uh, uh, quant way to quantify what your underlying theory is. And so there's some problems with this. Before we can even get to that point of comparing connectivity maps, uh, we have some problems that we need to uncover. One is that aggregation um, 
or excuse me, not aggregation, is that the appropriate lag has received a lot of attention. And uh, Joe talked about this in the beginning in, in the first talk, that Granger causality, where we have lagged relations, has been found to not work well on MRI data, yet a lot of people still do it. Um, and so, so that's kind of an issue, is trying to accommodate that we, um, we know that we want the contemporaneous level connections, but then at the same time, we know that there are lagged relations that exist, and that's because the bold or the blood uh, response, the, uh, the uh, oxygenation response that we're looking at in response to the neuronal activity is very slow and it's very delayed. And since it's a biological mechanism, we know that there's going to be lagged effects. For any region, we can predict itself pretty well by knowing its previous, its previous state. And, and that's just note. So that's the trade-off there is that we, we don't want to rely on lag because we know it's, it doesn't work well for MRI data, but we also can't ignore lag in a lot of modeling techniques because we know that it's there. And so then the variance would just be explained by something else that doesn't really explain it. So there's also a problem of within-group heterogeneity. And uh, what I mean by within-group heterogeneity is that within a certain sample, um, let's just say typically developing controls, you're going to see a lot of heterogeneity. And that's going to throw off your um, connectivity maps when you aggregate them, unless you take that into account. Um, but then at the same time, you, uh, you want the individual level maps. Uh, however, they may be riddled with noise. And then we get back to the, oops, we get back to the question uh, that I posited in the, in the slide before, is then once you get your connectivity maps in the individual level, what do you do with them? Uh, so, so we'll present some of those that take into account the heterogeneity. So this is the framework which I work in. Uh, it's outside of the Tetrad project, and so, um, but it's very similar to some of the approaches talked about in yesterday's talks uh, with um, the structural vector autoregression. Uh, I call it the unified sum because that's how it was introduced to me in the MRI literature. So what we have here is um, eta, our latent variable, which we make observed. So we have our variables, um, our regions of interest time series, are predicted by A, which is contemporaneous, and that's denoted here by a solid line uh, at time, plus the lagged relations, which is in the phi matrix, or the, uh, these um, dotted ones graphically, times uh, regions at time minus one. And you can see there you can have the autocorrelations, where a region one can predict <coughs> itself at the next time point. However, uh, I should note that the diagonal along the A matrix is going to be zero, because you cannot have four, region four predicting itself at the same time, of course. Uh, and then we have error. And so uh, this, is, this is the framework that we are using. And uh, what we see is that this, is a, this allows us to come up with reliable maps. And, and Joe alluded to this earlier as well, that uh, uh, the Tetrad programs work very well in contemporaneous without taking into account the lag, which is something that still confuses me, to tell you the truth, because we don't see that happening with the structural equation modeling approaches. Um, so, so there, it's, it's really doing well. And, and I need to learn why. <laughs> and so um, what we do is we have a model selection procedure. And so uh, what I'm doing now is I'm taking this equation and I'm showing you how we estimate it in structural equation modeling. And so um, just, just very briefly, uh, here we have our phi matrix, here we have our A matrix. Uh, we want to predict at time. We don't want to predict at time minus one. So if this is my beta matrix, which is read that uh, region of interest one predicts region of interest two at the next time point, this would then be open and this would be uh, estimated. And that would give you a beta weight and that would give you the weight of the relationship between ROI, ROI 1 and ROI 2 at a lag. Um, so we close these. We constrain the top ones because we don't want to try to predict um, it at t minus 1. And then what we do is we uh, use modification indices that are provided within LISRAL. They're also provided within LAVAN, which is what we use in our R implementation. And those are Lagrange multiplier equivalent, excuse me, equivalence, equivalences that are asymptotically squared distributed. So we can look at those and see. Uh, in my matrix of modification indices, which path is going to best improve that individual's model? So we start with an empty matrix. We go forward uh, with MRI data. I have never seen it not be the case that it is, let me say it another way, it's always the case that the autoregressive terms open up first. And then we will cover our contemporaneous path, similar in the way that uh, Dr. Hoover talked about yesterday, where you, uh, you can also uh, estimate a VAR and then run um, this model search on the errors and you will recover the contemporaneous. Uh, and so that, that's our model search procedure at the individual level. So to, to totally flesh out why we even take into account the lagged relationships, which might be um, 
maybe not necessary for some economists, but uh, perhaps for people who haven't thought about this issue before, um, is that when we do our model search without taking into account the lagged relations, this is our model that we get. And so I'm just going to highlight for you the misspecifications. It only gets one of the paths right, and all of these are phantom paths or false positives that do not exist. And so this was. Um, this is, this is the primary reason why we always include the lags. And we're not so interested in the lagged effects, to tell you the truth. We're interested in the contemporaneous effects. But in the SEM world, if you don't take into account the lagged effects, you're going to get spurious contemporaneous effects. So uh, that's a resolution to the first problem of uh, what do we do about the trade-off of lagged effects and and the contemporaneous effects, which in that we really want the contemporaneous effects, but we must control for the lagged effects. So this is going to bring us to number two. And this is the problem that I find most interesting and that I've really been focusing on lately, so I'm happy to present it here. Uh, there's a lot of within-group heterogeneity. And we know that uh, on the symptom level, we know that ADHD, for instance, have uh, mul multiple symptom profiles. We also know that um, some of the uh, findings from connectivity mapping has been inconsistent across ADHD. They've been having a hard time linking ADHD to genes or environment, and they think that it might be because there's multiple bind biological mechanisms that underlie ADHD, for instance. And so I'm interested in how do we obtain reliable results when you have aggregation within your sample, or excuse me, when you have heterogeneity within your sample, and then once you get your results and you have these heterogeneity, heterogeneous individual level maps, how do you then make some sort of group level inference or comparison? And uh, to drive home the issue for me, uh, I'm going to present what we think is ideal, and that would be, or what we think is happening. All of our underlying um, methods, uh, with the, example, uh, the exception of something like images or images, uh, when people typically run unified sum or some sort of correlation matrix on an aggregated data set in MRI, they concatenate them. So they'll put one time series on top of another, or they'll um, average maybe the inverse correlation matrix. But in any case, um, the underlying assumption is that the group model should map onto the individuals. It's a basic assumption here. And uh, what, what I'm presenting is that perhaps that doesn't always happen. And what could happen is you can get a group model that does not explain one individual in your group. And so then what are your inferences based on if this is the case? If, you, if it's so heterogeneous that the group model that comes up and trying to explain all of the variants doesn't explain an individual, then um, maybe you should go back to the individual level. However, there's problems with individual level, and that's very difficult to reliably get results when you have data with the type of noise that MRI has. So that's the trade-off. Um, so with empirical data, and this is taken from some traumatic brain injury data, and this was back when we first started on this problem, um, here is the map that we obtained from aggregating in the typical way of concatenating. Here is the maps we attained when we did individual level analyses. <laughs> and so you can see immediately, first off, this doesn't tell the whole story. But that's OK, because there's probably some paths, or I say paths, but I, by path I mean edges or adjacencies. There's probably some edges that do exist for the majority of the population, because we are all humans with basic same physiology. Um, but what we see is a lot of individual level nuances. And uh, the width here on this side corresponds to the frequency. And so what I, what I want to take home from this paper, or excuse me, what I want you to take home from this example is that certain ones aren't captured. Like, for instance, here we do have um, across individuals, most of them had some connection here. Uh, the directionality differed uh, for about half of them. Half went this way, the other half went that way. And here, that whole connection is missed. And, and so by aggregating, we're missing connections that probably do exist for the majority. Um, and for instance, this one, for the majority, went from right to left, and in this side, it's reversed. So we're getting the wrong map, even if we aren't interested in the individual level nuances. By aggregating, we were getting the wrong, um, the wrong group level inferences. And let me just uh, reiterate that this is specific to the SEM and some sort of a and the type uh, where you might concatenate. Okay. So you might be looking at that map, um, which my advisor called the spaghetti map of uh, individual level connections. And it's like, well, how do you know that that's not noise? That could very well be noise, or it could be interesting. Now, an MRI research historically has thought of it as noise, that we want to get the group level paths to pick out signal from noise. And so there's false negatives that could Oh, there's false negatives. There's a few reasons why this could happen. We could have false negatives occur because um, effects of interest 
uh, are strongly positive for some and strongly negative for others, and so then it washes out to zero on the aggregate level. Or it could be that um, only a subset of individuals have this effect, but it's very important for that subset of inf individuals. So then by getting the aggregate and not including that, we're missing information on that individual. Uh, false positives can be induced in a number of ways. One would be um, if you have an outlier, if you have a few individuals who have a very strong connection between two regions, they could, they could drive it. Um, another reason would be Excuse me, if, you, uh, if there is no one model. In structural equation modeling, if you do a model search, it's going to try to explain variance. And so it might uh, find something that really is just modeling noise. Uh, and then this is brought up by Clark, thank you, that uh, when you aggregate, uh, if you have two distinct groups and you aggregate, then the you could find opposite findings because of the Ulsumson simpson effect. <laughs> and so this is a simulated example where we have uh, three groups and, or excuse me, three participants. So just with three people, having one of the participants have a reversed connection between one and four, but everything else the same. Uh, we're going to see that when we aggregate and do our search, first off, these become negative and contemporaneous. And that's not so much of a problem. At least it's gathering that there is a connection between those two. Um, it's getting a little bit thrown off because there's the heterogeneity <laughs> added. What's discerning is that, or, or disconcerting is that there is this phantom path that doesn't exist. And so I'm really trying to drive home that with just very moderate heterogeneity, where we just had this one path that was flipped for participant number three, we don't get the right aggregate result. So we go back to here. And uh, again, you might say, well, we want the aggregate because it, all of the individual level models could be because of noise. And so there's meaningful and less meaningful causes of individual level uh, adjacencies, that, or excuse me, edges that we might find. Um, one could be that there's more than one typical process. This is what we think might be happening, or this is what we want to ca capture. We want to see, uh, is there heterogeneity because there's actually more than one best way to solve this problem if they're doing a cognitive task? Um, or is there, um, does it tell us something about the person? Does it tell us if that person drank too much caffeine or if they, uh, if, um, they have ADHD? So, so we want the meaningful differences. That's what we're trying to get at with our individual level analysis. What's less interesting are things such as this, um, biological idiosyncrasy, if they just have larger vein draining for a certain reg region. Uh, statistical noise, which is, of course, um, the only thing that I could help to uh, reduce. Uh, systematic differences in data collections across sites. We see this with all this um, multi-site sharing, such as the Abide or the Human Connectome Project. Um, and then motion is a huge one. Uh, a lot of, uh, there, there was a very important paper by Power, um, 2012, where he showed that some of the results about ADHD and controls were because ADHDs move more. And that, that, that we really need to take into account these micro movements and to uh, scrub them or take them out of our, our um, our series because it's throwing off all of their relationships because they're, they're moving together. All right, so this brings us to the motivating objectives for the algorithm that we use that Joe alluded to earlier. It's called Gimme, and uh, it's, it's performing reasonably well. We, uh, we want to pick out signal from noise. So much like the current objectives, if you're trying to aggregate by concatenating, we want to see is there, if there is something that exists at the group level, we want to get that. We want to get at things that we can say is nomothetic or that exists for most individuals. Uh, we, uh, we also want individual level nuances to surface. However, uh, Smith um, just did uh, that study with 28, 28 different simulations. And uh, Joe in introduced it earlier today uh, that found that most, most methods could not identify both the connection and the directionality of the effect. Uh, Joe's been able to do that with uh, some of the uh, developments in the Tetrad project. But uh, we want to make sure that we're not going to get noise, which is, has been plaguing a lot of methods. So this brings us to um, group iterative multiple model estimation, or GIMI. Uh, it starts with a group structure. Second step, it goes to individual level. So I'll walk you through the group structure. First, uh, if you can recall earlier in the slides when I showed you a, a matrix of beta values or beta, pa beta patterns that we will allow to be open. So it was the lower part of the matrix. And so what we do is we search across those matrices and uh, we look at the corresponding modification index to see 
for which element, so for which path, uh, maybe it's a lagged uh, path of region of interest one on itself, or maybe it's region of interest one predicting region of interest four at time, we allow all of them to compete. And then we identify which path, if opened, as indicated by our modification ind indices, would improve the majority of the individual's models. We're trying to get at a path that's going to improve the majority of individuals. And in this way, it's not, uh, it's not at all sensitive to extremes, because an extreme still just gets one count. It doesn't matter how significant that would be, or how significantly that would, a path being open would improve a model, because uh, it's just that one person. And so that's just taking in, into account with uh, all the other individuals. So if there is at least one path, we free it, we go back up here, we run the path for each individual with that, mo with that element freed, and then we see, look at the modification indices again. There comes a point where there is not a path that, if freed, will improve the majority of individuals' models. This point is an interesting point because in some data sets, this leaves us with a quite sparse group level map. In others, you'll see a much more populated group level map. And so this really is a, a first indication at how heterogeneous your data are. So here, you, at this step, um, by adding paths, some paths may have become non-significant. So you prune paths at the group level that are not significant for the majority. Then you start the individual level paths. So you use the group level paths as a start. So now our null model is not an empty matrix uh, with zeros. It, has, uh, it estimates for each individual a unique parameter, but at the pattern that was found at the group level. We prune non-significant paths that were found at the individual level. We keep all of those at the group level. And then we run a confirmatory individual model. So in the end, what we arrive at is a group level structure that we know exists for the majority of individuals. And individual level structures, in addition to individual level path weights, or um, to use the words uh, that's probably more appropriate for this conference, um, uh, edge weights. So we have edge weights and, um, for each individual. So differing patterns, differing weights. How does it work? Well, um, Joe and colleagues here have just published a paper uh, uh, comparing some non-Gaussian approaches. And uh, using the same metric, we have, um, I added Gimme to, uh, to his table, actually. And so uh, we have Gimme here on the right. And we see that just in general, I don't want to pick this part apart because this isn't a methods talk. Um, so we, uh, I'm going to get to the application. But uh, in general, we're doing all right. This is recall of edges. And we're doing OK. There are some areas where the non-Gaussian are doing better, but there's some where we're, uh, Gimme's doing better. And one of them that Joe mentioned that matters, some of this is just the addition of noise. The one that really matters is that uh, Gimme seems to do particularly well in terms of gathering, recovering models that have non-stationarity in the effects. So the effects are non-stationary across time. And so Gimme can recover those, and then we can then put it into a time-varying model. But uh, that's, that's not for this talk. But uh, I, I present this to show you that our models are recovering at a similar rate as the models that, um, that you all are using. Uh, there are some drawbacks, though, some pretty big ones. Uh, you can't do 50 regions of interest using my approach. It caps out at about 25. And so there's, that's a huge advantage of the PC algorithms and, and uh, greedy estimation search. And then um, uh, that's probably the biggest drawback. Um, you, and then in some cases, there's better directionality recovery with the uh, non-Gaussian approaches. Yes? Uh, the score is uh, on the group level graph? This, these are, oh, thank you. Uh, these are, this was taken from, um, uh, Joe ran his analyses on 10 individuals. And then, um, give me, this starts with all 50, each data set. Each of these 28 simulations, actually it's reduced to 26 because two of them w wouldn't work for other reasons. But uh, so for Gimme, we do it on the full 50 individuals, but then we, it populates down to the individual level maps. So these are the individual level recoveries. But it started with the group level. And uh, we, um, similar to, to what Joe does, is we've gone down to 10 and it works similarly. But if you do individual level path searches, on uh, using the unified sum that I showed, you will get pretty decent recovery, but the directionality will be no better than chance. So get about 50% directionality. So what we really get from using Gimme is getting the directionality. And so here, um, just a, a last slide to, to drive home what, kind of what Gimme does, is that the simulations presented here were pretty much homogenous. Everyone was homogenous. There was one where the groups had different beta weights that were systematic. Uh, however, it's homogenous. The patterns were homogenous. 
What happens if there's a lot of heterogeneity in the patterns, which is what, as I introduced, is what I'm interested in. I want to get patterns for each individual that vary if they have to vary. If not, that's great if we just have one group level map that explains people. So here I generated data where there's very little similarity across the individuals. This is 100 individuals. Uh, I made it so everybody <coughs> has these lagged effects because that is something we consistently see in MRI research. And I made it that everybody has the input vector, the e external stimuli, um, the experimental stimuli that's convolved with the hemodynamic response function that Joe also introduced briefly earlier. Uh, so we, we convolve it with the hemodynamic response, which is uh, what we would expect from the neuronal activity to the bold peak. Because this is something that we would also be, be able to predict, is uh, where is the sensory input coming in? That's pretty predictable in these models. Once you get up to uh, higher regions, it's uh, less, less easier to predict exactly what's going to cause it. I opened up these paths. I had uh, each path have a different probability across individuals of being open. So this is completely random. Give me recovered all of the paths. Uh, the 95% of the directionality was also recovered. Um, aggregation only recovered the lagged effects. It missed the experimental stimuli. And then there were no connections between the people. This is what I think is the most interesting in this slide, is that if I did individual level searches, so I did my unified SEM on each of the 100 participants, I recovered only 83% of the paths, but 52% were in the wrong direction. And so just by opening up the autoregressive first, because that was what was recovered at the group level, we obtained better recovery of the directions. <coughs> and this is also similar to what um, was spoken about in the econometrics literature, is that, uh, or the econometrician talks yesterday, was uh, uh, they immediately take into account the lag, but so in my search algorithm, it has to be added, and by, by doing the individual level searches, sometimes it wasn't added appropriately, and that's, that's where you get the bang for adding it here. Okay. So going back to application and how I started all of this was, once we get all of these maps, what do we do? We have, thank you. We have, um, we, we now have as many maps potentially as we have individuals. How are we gonna make some group inferences? So standard inferential methods, if I wanted to compare two subgroups, I'm implicitly assuming that these two subgroups are homogenous that my controls are homogenous, my ADHD are homogenous, and I'm trying to find differences in them. And there might be some aspects of brain functionality that does work like that, where the ADHD are homogenous and they all have a similar profile and controls don't. But uh, given the differential responses to ADHD treatment and the heterogeneity we see in the symptom profiles, there's reason to believe that there's also heterogeneity in the brain mechanisms underlying ADHD that we have yet to explore because we always combine ADHD into one group. So uh, this is also true, um, I, I would like to uh, talk more with Catherine about this, but in autism spectrum disorder, some of my uh, collaborators such as Susie Scherf and John Ritchie at Virginia Tech, they're very concerned about that in autism spectrum because they have a similar type of problem where you have uh, many different profiles of symptomology and uh, and uh, it's more pronounced in ADHD, which is what I have been working with, with Damien Fair at uh, Oregon Health and Science Un University. So I'm going to briefly just show you conceptually what it is that I, I aim to do. Uh, here we have individuals that I've organized meaningfully based on female and male. So this is what we often do in research. We want to group people, and then we want to show differences. But uh, it becomes kind of arbitrary because our, all of us are so multidimensional. I could equally do it on Latino, non-Latino, or any, any other number of dimensions. And perhaps we will find differences, but uh, there's a whole world of, of possible differences that I could look for. So another way that we could do it is we could group people based on their brain maps. And then we can identify ADHD, and then maybe another group of ADHD. Or maybe we'll see more, more controls over here. But in that way, we're not forcing a priori subgroups. And we are able to see what really defines the individuals and grouping people based on their brain maps, which is what we're ultimately interested in, is their brain connectivity. Uh, so just graphically with simulated data, this is the, the same uh, idea. I'm going to rush right through it because we're running low on time, uh, is that we want to identify groups based on their pattern of connections. So this is how we're doing it. We identify our regions of interest, um, much like Catherine discussed, where you, you get a time series for each region, 
And then you uh, identify a connectivity map for each individual. Uh, you could do this using one of the Tetrad approaches or mine. Either way, uh, it, it would run through this part the same. You just get your individual level maps. And then uh, you create a correlation matrix of individuals. So here we have how similar people's individual, how similar people's beta estimates are on their parameter estimates. Now I use community detection. And what that's going to do is, that much like cluster analysis, it's going to group people into subgroups based on how similar they are in their brain maps. Uh, we, again, just revisit the, the study. This is resting state connectivity. Our mean age is nine. We have 61% male, 40% ADHD. By resting state, I mean they're staring at a crosshair. And resting state might be a little bit of a misnomer, but it's too adapted in this field for us to change it. Uh, it really is just not doing a task. We don't know if they're resting. They could be very anxious. We're not sure. So, um, uh, but, but we have been able to see, uh, it started with Biswell in 19, 1995, that there are systematic differences between populations in their resting state connectivity. And it's, in some cases, better than task-based uh, approaches, especially for ADHD populations, because some people might not be able to attend to tasks. And so then having a task there is meaningless if they're not paying attention anyway. So then what is the task that they're doing? So uh, we identified these regions that have previously been implicated in ADHD research. These are frontal parietal regions that are uh, involved in task level control. Uh, Dosenbach found these in a meta-analysis, so we found that we used those coordinates and we extracted these regions. We ran it through GIMI. This was our group level map, and uh, to be clear, we put our ADHD end controls together, because we didn't want to make any a priori notions about differences or anything. So we put them together, we get this group map, which actually is strikingly similar to what people have gotten with aggregated approaches. So, there's convergent validity for you, that if you use two totally different approaches, this tends to be how these regions seem to connect. Then we did our individual level search, and uh, each potential connection had at least one individual who had it. Uh, we, saw, we saw quite a bit of diversity in our connections. So then we, we did things a little bit of the traditional approach. by We compared our a priori diagnoses, which were um, done in-house, at the experiment site, uh, so we didn't use doctor's diagnoses. We used um, very strict criteria for whether or not they truly are ADHD. Um, and we compared ADHD and controls, uh, much in a manner that people have been interested in comparing them previously. And that would be, uh, for instance, by counting or looking at the pathways. And we found for all of these, uh, no significance. And that's even before I did any control for multiple comparisons. So we found no differences between the groups. Um, this will be elucidated a little bit later why we didn't, uh, well, in a minute. And uh, we also found no difference in the number of connections. So thinking back to that less is more hypothesis I brought up, um, nobody's actually applied it to ADHD, but we don't find any evidence of it here. And there, there's any number of um, uh, things we could, uh, we could compare between ADHD and control. Since these are the two most common, I, I chose these, and we didn't find any differences. When I subgrouped them, I came up with uh, five groups, A through E, and we notice a, a different in, in a pattern of connections. Uh, here I'm only going to show the group level because it's, it's a much easier story to tell and it's cleaner. Um, red means that it's higher than the average of all of the others. Blue means that it's lower. So we see very low connectivity of, among these in these group level paths that we require to be open to everybody. Uh, very low um, front uh, anterior to posterior connectivity weight and uh, a different pattern here where it's much higher, and then we see some increased connectivity here. So here we have our subgroups, which are truly uh, subgrouped by their brain similarities. Did that relate to ADHD? We found that it did. Uh, we found uh, one of the groups was predominantly controlled. We found ADHD split between these two groups, and then we found a little bit of overlap. And from a mental health perspective, and an intervention perspective, uh, this could really help elucidate, like for instance, why are these people ADHD? What happened? And how come these, these people who should otherwise be diagnosed as ADHD, what is it that they are doing that is preventing them from getting, getting that diagnosis? Is there something about their environment that may be inhibiting these, uh, these traits from coming out? And so this is uh, enabling us to ask kind of these deeper questions. And other questions such as, uh, does differential medication, can we then uh, medi learn a little bit about how these different medications are working on ADHD by looking at the brain functioning of these two groups? Uh, so just to revisit these maps and uh, to tag on the ADHD risk level to it, 
Uh, this one was found to be productive. This was our green group from the previous slide, which was predominantly control. Uh, and here we see our risk, our two risk. And this is why we didn't find any differences between ADHD and control when I did a comparison of the beta weights for the a priori groups, is that here, this one's higher and this one's lower. And we see an opposite effect here. And so we see the washout effect in that they were separated based on some of them had higher frontal activity and lower posterior, but, but the frontal activity wasn't feeding down to lower. Some of them have lower posterior and higher um, anterior, and that was feeding it down. And these are actually mapping onto two separate um, parallel theories of ADHD. So here we see that both of them are right, which makes everybody happy. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to finish up uh, because I believe I'm totally out of time. But so here's just a conclusion slide is that we have an algorithm which can get um, paths, but is um, pales in comparison to the Tetrad project in, in some aspects. And then we um, were able to meaningfully get groups from these connectivity maps. and. Uh, so this could, in turn, help science, is the last poem. <laughs> sure. Catherine? Yeah. I, I had a question about your subgroups. Sure. Uh, you broke them up into five subgroups. Was that, what was that based on? Sure. Um, so that was based on uh, the connectivity weights. Uh, so looking at these weights at individuals, and then I correlate one person's weights with another person, and I get this little element up here. So, so I populate a correlation matrix that's n individuals by n individuals of how similar their map correlate, how they're, they're similar their map weights are. And then you pick those five categories based on some level correlation? It's, um, it's based on the correlation matrix that's then, uh, I kind of skimmed through community detection because I wasn't sure how familiar people were with it. Uh, so community detection is traditionally used in MRI research to uh, find regions that work together. So you use a correlation matrix and then you find which regions work together. Uh, it, it started from social network where you use community detection uh, to see which people group together. So I went back to the original use of it and used it to see which people group together. Uh, it's an algorithm very similar, or, or you could think of it conceptually like uh, um, cluster analysis. But with cluster analysis, it's sometimes difficult to tell when to stop because you can keep going until you get one group or one individual in each group, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, the benefit for me of community detection is that you don't have any prior information. I didn't tell, give it any information other than um, the connectivity maps. And then uh, it decides on the correct number of groups. You set a threshold or something? Or? It's weighted. It's a weighted community detection algorithm. But that's a great question because um, there's been a proliferation of community detection algorithms and finding the appropriate one for this type of problem is actually something we're trying to do now. This might not be the best one, but we think it is. Yeah. Uh, Clark? Uh, I, I think you understated your case in comparing the slide, in the slide comparing uh, uh, our, uh, our work with yours on the Smith simulations. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a technical difference, uh, which is important, that, that uh, my colleague Ruben whispered in my ear. Uh, we, uh, so standardly, the data, including the Smith data, are filtered. Uh, mm -hmm. And the filter uh, normalizes the data. It takes out the non-Gaussian signal. Now, there's, there's a good reason for that filtering, because Howard's work, for example, shows that um, you get uh, correlations, fairly significant correlations, uh, locally, uh, if you don't filter. Uh, so the methods we use require that you reduce the filtering quite, quite significantly. Whether that's, whether that's good or bad is, is mute. I mean, we don't... We don't actually know in empirical data whether whether it uh, whether it damages things. Yours don't require that. The other thing, of course, is that in the Smith simulations, with the exception of one condition, all of the structures are the same. So that that really doesn't test the uh, the, the capacity that you have for identifying variation in individual structures. So um, I think you understated your case. Well, thank you for adding that then. <laughs> And not going the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying I overstated. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> oh, yes? So I, I'd love to see the, 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 the point about how you made it because it consists of lots of data sets. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering to what extent you think there might be heterogeneity within an individual's behavior uh, 
test. Even in the, the what if the control condition? That is a wonderful uh, question because we're working on it. <laughs> so uh, um, I was just talking with um, somebody uh, before uh, um, this talk that so we, we can identify non-stationarity pretty well somehow we can identify connections let me let me say that a little bit clearer we can I find the ed edges even if there's rampant non-stationarity and uh, so what, what we're doing now is we've um, we're taking the patterns found from this approach and then we're running it through um, a common filter like state space modeling approach to identify time varying parameters so how these connections are changing across time and what's um, interesting about the approach uh, actually my collaborator Peter Molinar came up with it uh, for he, he is also getting time varying contemporaneous connections which is something that's quite new, I believe. And so since we're curious about the contemporaneous, it's very important that we get the time varying contemporaneous. And so that's what we're doing now. And we're seeing it, uh, it, it happens in the case of MRI. I'm not sure your background. In the case of MRI with um, learning, so people habituate across the task, and you'll see different connectivities as they get it. Cause, and then you see like very distinct wiring that doesn't change. Whereas in the beginning, while they're trying to figure things out, uh, the edges there's a lot of edges because they're, they're trying different paths, if you will. And then um, also with olfactory sense, you'll see habituation. So as you smell something and you're trying to see what emotional, uh, what emotion it elicits or if it does, then, uh, or the response in the brain, you'll see that habituate across time. And so if we can see con the connectivity related to that, that would be great. So thank you for asking that. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, this is uh, um, really interesting. I was wondering if, uh, there's a concern about the following. So uh, there's going to be some trade-off between uh, uh, sample size and uh, uh, going from the individual to the group, right? Yeah. So it seems like there would be a kind of theoretical issue about uh, when you go to the individuals, you get more noise. But then when you aggregate by the patterns you got, you might be amplifying the noise. Uh, Whereas you, if you aggregate, of course, you've got this problem with the heterogeneous population. So it looks like uh, there's some kind of a saddle point there that might well, be optimal. I, I would wager that if we were aggregating in the method that I do it, um, and it's going to be led by noise, the same noise would prob which pop up in a, in a concatenated. Um, but I think it is a problem with sample size. We've done. Uh, We've looked, we start usually with 100 or 50, and then we do it down to uh, repeated samples with 10, kind of bootstrapping to see if we get the same results. And it's pretty consistent as low as 10. So if you just have 10 people in your sample, which is common for MRI to have as few as 10 people in your sample, uh, it still will improve your reliable recovery of, of individual level paths just by starting with that 10. And so I think, um, but, but there definitely is a trade off. Uh, and especially, I mean, to, to speak a little bit more to that, um, you might ask, like, at different sites, if you get different maps, how much is that because they have noise inherent in their machine versus that they truly are different? And so we're trying to work around ways of uh, like bootstrapping and seeing um, how to kind of tease that out. But yeah, that's a great point. Um, sh sure, down here. Um, so I, I agree entirely that there's lots of individual differences, problems that to the back end of the interpretation of most of this graphical stuff in Dr. Marisons. One concern I have really about the whole this whole graphic business, which I had arguments with Dr. Joe about several years ago. Uh, I'm not sure we resolved it, but uh, the idea of ours one of the problems, one of the individual differences of course in terms of anatomical differences you look at salsa and gyro maps, you can see 10 to 15 millimeter sort of variability, which suggests that if you don't do your registration and normalization carefully enough, by that I mean really carefully, and you don't do your GLM carefully, that you, those identification points are gonna be slightly different. The next step of that is the temporal extraction. So although you can use mean values, my money, you know, Ed Bulmer likes eigenvectors. Mm -hmm. Great, okay, so now you get different time series, probably with different autocorrelation parameters. Right. Could that also be the source of these individual differences? Well, all of that very yeah. <laughs> Let me try to think if I can remember all of that as I give my answer. But so uh, to, to your last point about um, using eigenvectors as opposed to uh, mean averages, we've explored that with empirical data of extracting them separately in those two different ways, and we get very similar results. And so um, a high correlation between those. And, uh, but of course, that's, that's 
related to the quality of the region that you have. Um, but to uh, one of your other points about uh, the different spatial structures, that's a huge problem for us with developing children and trying to get their FFA or their OFA. It's not distinct, and we can't identify it very clear. So then we're trying approaches of looking at, um, uh, we're, we're trying to get a group map of the spatial structure by leaving that person out and then trying to get an atlas for that. We're trying so many different mechanisms, and that's actually a little bit of what's holding up our progress on that paper, is trying to figure out how do we actually extract the data for these children. Right, if you go back to the individual differences in terms of registration to different templates, mm -hmm. um, that might, you know, if you start with their T1 and get a very good fit to that T1, then you might be able to extract a template. Some regions that are very different places. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, in Nancy Kenrich's original data, there were only 16 out of the <laughs> had an FFA. Okay. okay so, <laughs> yeah. I'm not even sure there is an FFA. That's another <laughs> but great. Thanks for the points. We have time for one more quick. How about you? Yeah. Uh, so how do you choose your region of interest? So because the model I see, uh, especially in ADHD, it's, uh, it's considered most a reward function, mm -hmm. uh, uh, reward area dysfunction. And I don't see like any DLPFC or accumbens or even amygdala involved in your ROIs. Okay. Now, I understand like it's easy yeah. to do a resting state, I mean, and because it's cheap and it's simple to do. Well, we didn't choose these regions because, let me um, go to a graph that has them listed. Um, we didn't choose these regions based on the ability to find them in resting state connectivity. We chose them, oh, I think I have the wrong one. We chose them based on prior work that had sh implicated them in ADHD uh, in terms of task level control and differences during task. Uh, so I, I rested on the knowledge of my collaborators with regards to choosing this. We, um, we could have also done default mode network or um, some of the attentional systems. However, uh, because these had been implicated in other research and there was just a paper about it that clearly outlined the atlas, that's why we chose these, just for this demonstration. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to see how it works with other ones because this is just but one, one take on it. And uh, another follow-up. Um, that we're working on is looking at uh, if we have different regions, do we do people fall into the same subgroups? Uh, because we we selected only 11 regions, and partly that's the limitation of my algorithm. It can't handle 128 regions. It can't handle like if you parcel it into the whole brain. Uh, so, that's, I think that's a great question to look into. Is to, if we looked at just the attentional control regions as, as, um, instead of these, uh, would would the groups break out the same, or is this just specific to those regions? So, yeah. But thank you. That's a great point. <laughs>